Well, the World Cup is happening soon. That's pretty cool. The last time I reviewed something to celebrate a global sports event was when I reviewed the Famicom versions of Hyper Olympic and Hyper Sports in anticipation of the 2020 Olympic Games in Tokyo, and things didn't go quite so well. Not only was the review a load of boring garbage with some terrible audio mixing, but the coronavirus pandemic swooped in about a month later and delayed the Tokyo Olympics to 2021. There have been previous times when the Olympics were completely cancelled, all of them because of war, but this was the first ever time in history where the Olympics were not only delayed, but also majorly interfered with by a global health crisis. But hey, at least the Mario and Sonic tie-in came out on time. The worst part, at least for me, is that I lost interest to the point of not even watching the Tokyo Olympics. I didn't even tune in to the live broadcast of the opening ceremony where they played Gradius music. Though, coincidentally enough, the opening ceremony was on July 23rd the same day I released one of my Ed and Nettie YouTube poops. The fact that I didn't bother with Tokyo 2020 is especially upsetting when I remember how excited I was for it ever since it was announced back in 2013. Anna was a bit of an Olympics fanatic when I was a kid, especially in regards to track and field. Go! Oh god, come on! Bolt's gotta win! Go, 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 no, 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 no! No, 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 yes! 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 Of course, my skills as a video maker have greatly improved in the almost three years since I made that review. Plus, the pandemic is only slightly less of a problem nowadays. So, I'm sure this will turn out fine. Anyways, let's talk football. Or soccer, if you live in the United States, Canada, Japan, or any other part of the world that doesn't call it football. Soccer has been around for a million years and every sentient being loves it unconditionally, so naturally we've seen a buttload of video games adapting it. Nowadays, at least in the West, you have the standard annual license releases from the likes of Konami and EA pretty much saturating the market. However, there were all kinds of soccer games and other sports games to choose from during the post-Atari and pre-internet era of gaming, and Nintendo's 8-bit machines, the Famicom and the NES, were no exception. Most of these games were based in realism, or at the very least attempted to adapt reality despite the somewhat more primitive technology, but then there were those few unsung heroes that remembered they were video games and took full advantage of it to bring people something special. With American football, you had the likes of Tecmo Super Bowl and the Blitz series. With basketball, you had good ol' NBA Jam. Baseball has been pretty standard in gaming, but titles like Mario Super Sluggers still exist. But there's a whole series of games spanning multiple decades that dedicates about half of its lineup to sports titles. Technos Japan's Naketsu series. I've previously talked about this series of high school violence and delinquency with its first sports title, Naketsu High School Dodgeball Club, more specifically its western localization, Super Dodgeball. Not only did this series help pioneer and perfect the beat-em-up genre with the likes of Renegade and River City Ransom, but it adapted its hot-blooded attitude to a large number of equally violent sports games, with the exception of rugby and American football for whatever reason. I guess those sports weren't cool enough for the Kitty Winks. Following the domestic success of Kunio's Famicom escapades, Technos Japan would put out a direct sequel to their dodgeball game in 1990 with a soccer game, Naketsu High School Dodgeball Club Soccer Edition. Plus, Nintendo would license this game from Technos Japan and modify it for release on the NES in North America and Europe. They even added support for their multi-tap adapters, the NES Satellite and the NES 4-Score, and thus, Nintendo World Cup was born. Back in Japan, the original Famicom game would be ported to the Game Boy, the Sharp X68000, the PC Engine, both on Hue Card and on CD-ROM, and the Mega Drive. Nintendo accordingly localized the Game Boy version as Nintendo World Cup for the West. For the purposes of this review, I'll be taking a look at the NES version of Nintendo World Cup, while also making some comparisons to the original Famicom game. Nintendo World Cup was put out in a few ways. Of course, there was the standard single cartridge release, but they also included the game in a few of their system bundles. 
North America got the NES sports set, which included the system, four controllers, the NES satellite, and a combo cartridge featuring Nintendo World Cup and another Technos Japan game, Super Spike V-Ball. This is the version of the game that I own, and this is also the version that I've recorded footage of for this review. Europe got an even better deal with the NES Super Set. The system, four controllers, the NES 4 score, and a combo cartridge featuring Nintendo World Cup along with Super Mario Bros. and Tetris. That's right, they took three of the NES's greatest games and united them together on a single cartridge. The NES may have undersold in Europe, but they sure got lucky with that bundle. Unfortunately, those are the only official releases of Nintendo World Cup. Since the rights to it are split between Nintendo and Technos Japan, it's never been given a proper re-release on any of Nintendo's Virtual Console libraries, and it currently isn't on the NES library of Nintendo Switch Online. So unless you're able to find a copy of the game for a good price, which is becoming much harder these days, your best bet is finding a ROM of the game somewhere to play on an NES or on a Famicom with a flash cartridge or in an emulator. Fortunately, the original Famicom game, the Ketsu High School Dodgeball Club Soccer Edition, has been re-released countless times, including the absolute best way to play it. Double Dragon and Kunio-kun Retro Brawler Bundle. This collection not only has the game fully translated into English and with the option of remove slowdown, bug fixes, extra features, and online multiplayer, but it even has the superior 1993 sequel, Kunio's Naketsu Soccer League, which sadly we never got on the NES. This is the method I recommend the most if you want to play the original Famicom game. Now with all that background info taken care of, it's time to kick off with Nintendo World Cup. When you start up the game, you have two modes to choose from. Tournament mode is the single player mode, but it can also be enjoyed in cooperative two-person multiplayer. Versus match mode is the competitive multiplayer mode, which can be enjoyed by two players, or by three or four players if you have the NES satellite or NES 4 score. Now, I don't own either of those adapters, and I don't have anyone available to demonstrate the multiplayer with, so I'll only be taking a look at the tournament mode in single player. Either way, the basic functions of the game are the same for both modes. The original Famicom game only allowed for two players in the Versus mode, but as mentioned earlier, support for Nintendo's four-player multitaps was added for Nintendo World Cup. Ironically enough, Technos did start implementing multitap support for the Naketsu Famicom games that were made after the soccer one, starting with Downtown Naketsu March. The original Famicom game also had a story that went with the tournament mode, where Kunio and the Naketsu Dodgeball Club fill in for their school in the soccer championships as Naketsu's soccer team recovers from food poisoning. Kunio does this as a request of the team's manager Misako, who made her series debut in this game. She would eventually become Kunio's girlfriend and would even be a playable character in later titles in the Naketsu series. The story, along with its various cutscenes, was completely removed from Nintendo World Cup, which instead has you pick a team from one of 13 different countries to compete in the World Cup and bring them to victory. Funny enough, the Japan team, which I picked, has Kunio and his best friend Ricky in it. It's quite funny when you consider that Ricky wasn't even in the original Famicom game, since he's a student of Hanazono High School rather than Neketsu High School. The character sprites were modified to look a bit different, though Kunio still retains his uber cool pompadour. This would technically make Nintendo World Cup the first international appearance of Kunio and Ricky, Though there wouldn't be any unaltered release of a Neketsu game in the West until Super Dodgeball on the Neo Geo in 1996, which was coincidentally enough the last video game Technos Japan ever released before they went bankrupt that same year. The way the game works at its core is mostly how one would expect from a soccer video game. If you know how soccer works and how it's played, which I'm sure is information well ingrained into the minds of at least 95% of the human populace, you'll at least know most of what's going on. But don't let the fact that this is a soccer game fool you. This ain't your average video fushpiel. This is Nintendo World Cup, and it's got a lot going for it to bring you an experience that's just as fresh as it is fun. One thing that makes this game unique from other soccer games and most other sports titles is that rather than switching control between multiple teammates, you control only one player, the team captain, and the rest of the team is controlled by the CPU. Before the start of a match, you can assign positions for six of the members on your team. 
You can also set up the strategy that you want your teammates to follow. This will affect whether they'll try to dribble or pass the ball when they have it, whether or not the goalkeeper will abandon their post, how frequently they'll try to shoot for a goal when given the opportunity, and whether or not they'll automatically try to tackle whoever has the ball when the other team has it. These settings can also be changed during halftime if you so desire. The main strategy of Nintendo World Cup is about you, the player, using the A or B buttons to make calls to your teammates telling them what to do while also actively participating in the action. It's a bit like that one Pac-Man game, but far more responsive. This design style was very unique for its time, and even for today, and I honestly find it very enjoyable. While it is definitely fun to always be in direct control of the ball in a soccer game or any ball game, giving calls to your teammates and accompanying them in hostile situations makes you really feel like you're on a team, and that's super cool. And the AI of your teammates is more helpful than you'd think. While there will be times that they screw up by accident, they can take care of themselves quite well depending on the behavior settings you set for them. Sometimes it's better to let them do their own thing while helping them out, rather than spamming calls to them to do something in anticipation of the ball coming to them. I certainly learned that lesson in the harder matches near the end of tournament mode. Though, since you're only controlling one player, the game's camera follows the ball around rather than you, so your character won't always be in plain view on the screen. Thankfully, the game also includes a small map showing where you are on the field, making it easy to either get to where the action is happening, or position yourself properly to gain control of the ball when it's airborne. You know what they say, there's no I in team. But there are plenty of I's in anti-disestablishmentarianism. And there are way too many eyes in Biblically Accurate Angels! Another standout quality of Nintendo World Cup, and any of the Niketsu games really, is the violence! While the way the game works is still just soccer at its core, the players are able to attack each other. In fact, part of succeeding in this game is actively attacking opponents in an attempt to knock them over by either tackling them when they get the ball, or shooting the ball at them when they run towards you. And if you really think about it, a lot of rules in sports like soccer wouldn't exist if we as human beings weren't so susceptible to serious damage. Of course, there are plenty of rules put in place to keep these sports fair and challenging, but all those other rules are only there to keep people from killing each other. You can actually KO the other players if you knock them over enough times, and their unconscious bodies will remain on the field laying there until after halftime. What's even crazier is that the computer players on either side will pass the ball to a teammate regardless of whether or not they're still standing. That makes it easy to position yourself over the body of an opponent and steal the ball. The only other game I know of where limp bodies not only remain where they fall, but also act as a marker for the player, is Doom. That's how you know the Niketsu series is hardcore. Though if you think you can knock down the opposing goalkeeper in tournament mode, you'd mostly be wrong. The goalkeeper can't be hit by the ball, at least not with a standard shot, and they'll either dive in the direction of the ball to punch it out of the way, or just catch the ball if its path lines up with them. And if you get too close to them while you're still dribbling the ball, they'll knock your ass over. It can actually get pretty hairy at the goal line sometimes. thing that can knock over the goalkeeper, however, is either a super shot or a high power shot. The power shot mechanic from Super Dodgeball returns in the form of super shots and high power shots. A super shot can be performed by pressing the A and B buttons simultaneously, either while standing still for a bicycle kick or while running for a diving headbutt, which is useless, unfortunately. You're limited to using only five super shots per half, so don't expect to always be spamming them to win. Unless you're playing the original Famicom game, as the limit on power shots was actually added for Nintendo World Cup. However, there is no limit in either game to high power shots, which can be performed by shooting the ball after taking a certain number of steps. Like with the power shots in Super Dodgeball, each team in Nintendo World Cup has their own unique super shot and high power shot, so you have plenty of options to choose from in finding the super shot that suits you best. And as with the power shots in Super Dodgeball, Nintendo World Cup's super shots prove to be just as devastating as they are awe-inspiring.
As with the violence and powerful attacks, the comically over-the-top nature introduced in Super Dodgeball and expanded upon in River City Ransom is in full swing in Nintendo World Cup. The character sprites in the game are even modeled exactly like the ones in River City Ransom and would continue to be modeled that way for the other Neketsu titles on the Famicom and even some of the more recent Neketsu titles. The brutal force of the attacks is accentuated once again by the animated facial expressions, giving the game that signature liveliness the Neketsu series is known for. While the range of expressions isn't as vast in this game as the likes of River City Ransom, what's provided here still helps to service the action on the screen. And if you think that's cool, some of the ports of the original Famicom game actually added voice clips of the player's painful grunts. Another signature Neketsu attribute in Nintendo World Cup is fantastic music from the likes of Kazuo Sawa. His use of fast, high-energy melodies with soothing harmonization and vibrato always provides for some rockin' music that gears you up for the perilous mayhem ahead. And yes, there is an annoyance with the music pausing for a short moment whenever the game switches screens after a goal is scored, but that was just a limitation they couldn't really do anything about, and a common occurrence in just about any Famicom or any game with screen changing moments. In addition to the background music, you also get some fun jingles that play before each match, depending on which country you're about to face. I'd particularly like to highlight the jingle used for Russia's team because... Yeah, they knew what they were doing there. Now, the tournament mode in Nintendo World Cup takes quite a long time to get through, especially since they actually made the amount of time for each half of a match much longer than in the original Famicom game. Thankfully, a password system is implemented for the tournament mode, and you get a password at the end of each match, so you don't have to beat the game in one sitting. What's also certainly helpful about this password feature is that tournament mode starts off ridiculously easy. Once you get good enough at the game, you can absolutely devastate the CPU and win by 30 to nothing, or even higher. A part of me feels that the difficulty in the first few matches of tournament mode is a tad too easy, though at least you can just start at one of the later matches in the game using a password. In fact, that's exactly what I did while getting the footage for this review so I wouldn't get bored from constantly winning a bunch of easy matches. Though speaking of difficulty, things get much tougher near the end, especially in the semifinals when you face Argentina. Maybe it's just me, but Argentina will fuck you up. The team, not the country. In the later matches, the CPU opponents are able to run much faster than you and your teammates, making it impossible to chase after them once they pass you by. Now, things are still manageable at this point despite such a disadvantage, but the super shot that Argentina has takes the odds to an absolutely ridiculous level. It's so powerful that it penetrated my goalkeeper's defense almost every time. In fact, I managed to beat every other team I faced without losing once, but I faced Argentina five times without winning once. The fourth loss came extremely close, so it seemed possible, but then this happens and I'm like, fuck this shit, and just used a password to skip Argentina, leading to the final boss, West Germany. <laughs> You'd think that Russia would be made the final team that you face, similarly to what was done in Super Dodgeball, but I guess they wanted to change things up a bit before the end of the Cold War. And surprisingly, I managed to beat West Germany on my first attempt. They were still a challenge, don't get me wrong, but their super shot was nowhere near the OP level of Argentina's, making the challenge far more fair and allowing me to make a proper comeback whenever I made a mistake. Alright, I've taken my team to the top. We've overcome the odds, we've kicked some ass, and we've absolutely achieved the ultimate victory. What happens now? The ending for tournament mode in Nintendo World Cup sees your team standing proud as they accept the championship trophy and their country's flag is raised high. After that, you get a the end picture and then get kicked back to the title screen, or the main menu if you're playing on a combo cart like I am. We unfortunately do not get any sort of end credits. So the ending is quite lackluster. 
This is quite a shame, especially since the original Famicom game did have end credits and a song to accompany them. In fact, the Famicom game also showed halftime cutscenes of each team getting up to shenanigans in the locker room, while Nintendo World Cup's halftime just shows the score with a doll dressed in the opposing team's cultural attire. I personally feel that these fun side moments with the characters should have been left in or at least reinvented somewhat for Nintendo World Cup. These moments would have added to the lively and fun-filled cheeky nature that I praise this game and the other Neketsu games for having. Evidently, these are just minor gripes, and they don't majorly ruin my enjoyment of Nintendo World Cup. Aside from that, the only thing I can really fault Nintendo World Cup for is only having different field types show up during versus match mode. Tournament mode in the original Famicom game had some matches take place on different types of fields that affect the movement of the players in the ball. For whatever reason, tournament mode in Nintendo World Cup was changed to only feature the standard grass field. I feel that keeping the changing field types in tournament mode would have been a wiser move since that was an attribute that helped to change things up a bit in the original Famicom game. Evidently, the different field types are still in versus match mode, no matter which version you play, and the game is most fun in multiplayer, so I can't be too hard on Nintendo World Cup for removing the field variety in tournament mode. Ultimately, Nintendo World Cup shines brightly with its excellent controls, design, action, visual humor, and music. These elements come together to really demonstrate how sports video games can sometimes be more than just replications of reality. The fun factor is so high with this one, especially with the multiplayer, that I truly think that it's not only the greatest soccer game on the NES, but the greatest sports game on the NES. And that's why Nintendo World Cup for the NES gets an approval from me. I hope you guys enjoyed this review, and I hope you stick around for whatever crazy thing I do next. And if you plan on watching the 2022 World Cup in Qatar, I hope you have a fun time watching it. And I say good luck to whichever country you're rooting for. And as always, thank you everybody for watching. I'm Andrew Ambrose, and I'll catch you later.